The Committee to Protect Journalists, USA, brought out a report for which I wrote the forward recently, about two months ago, it was out in August sometime. In this country, 27 journalists, 27, have been murdered since 1992. Um, and these journalists, these 27, you can establish, there were many more murdered, but these 27, it can be established that they were murdered because of what they wrote. Okay? They were murdered because of what they wrote. That is an astonishing figure if you go by that kind of, if that stringent evidence, uh, evidential process that they did. 27 journalists. Now, I analyzed their data and I wrote the forward. Let me tell you some of the things. Um, last year there were three. In the last year, you remember, there were three murdered. I'm not counting the rationalists and that's another problem. All your three rationalists were writers and journalists. Please understand, they were also being attacked. Dabulkar was attacked for what he was writing. Pansare for what he wrote. Okay? Kalburgi, an academic who also wrote. But the three professional journalists or journalists as we understand them who were murdered in the last year, here are some of, and the 27 overall. Here are some interesting things for you. All the three were Indian language journalists. If you, could, if you look at the 27, not one of them was working in an urban metro. It also argues a different class background of the journalist. It is impossible to find in those 27 one wholly English speaking, English writing journalist working. And it is impossible to find anyone working in corporate media English pub publications. India today lost a person who was Hindi. There is a big class difference and composition, class social background difference between journalists working in the Angrezi media and in the non-Angrezi media, in the Indian language media. So most of the journalists, most of the journalists were non-metro or rural, either non-metro or rural. Most, many of them were freelancers or stringers because independent journalists today can only survive by being freelancers or stringers. Though I believe there is space even now in the mainstream media within which you can play as I did for 36 years. Uh, but the spaces are shrinking. In the process of what we're doing, we're not, but the overall process, we're not just killing journalists, we're killing journalism itself. What happens when one of these rural journalists gets killed? Immediately we delegitimize that person. The stories will be, was he really a journalist? Or was he part of some corrupt nexus locally? You're, these are the people who have lost their lives to bring you some information. We delegitimize them. Because, and this is one thing, I have now come to hate and formally broken with the definition of professional journalist, which is today dictated by corporate media. Okay, so if you are a professional journalist, if you are a journalist who is covering the anti-POSCO agitation, or you are covering the Polavaram Dam, which by the way is much bigger, a hell of a lot bigger than Narmada, and again it's measure of how much your universe has shifted. In the 1980s, there was a healthy debate in the media about Narmada. And there were a fair number of people writing against the dam. Polavaram, how many of you have even heard or can tell me anything about that dam? Sir, I can. Yep. Thank you. That's one. Sir, and <laughs> okay. Sorry. You, by the way, in, I noticed that in the leftward book stall, there is a brilliant, brilliant book about it. Yeah, I can. Sorry. That's all right. Can you, can you relax, relax, sit down. Uh, there is a wonderful book in there. It's called People's History of a River. I strongly recommend you read this book by R. Uma Maheshwari. Okay, Akar Publishers, and it's, it's a wonderful book. And it really, but the fact is, look at the distance between the discussion, debate, reporting over Narmada Dam and the silence on the Polavaram Dam, which is much larger as a project than Narmada. 
So that's also a, a distance, a measure of the distance you've changed. Now look at this. Again, the 27 journalists, the composition which I told you about. Look at the fact of the kind of intimidation, brutalization of journalists in, say, Chhattisgarh. It hasn't really sparked that great outcry. Now, why, you can ask, are there no big names, no big corporate media journalists? Because we work within a framework where the journalism has been tamed. You're not going to cause that much offense to anybody. If you do, you will soon be a freelancer, you know, which is a form of disguised unemployment. <laughs> and so you, you, the corporate media have already tamed their journalists. There are wonderful journalists in the corporate media who don't realize 10, 20 percent of their potential because they're reined in. They can't step beyond particular, you know, you can, I mean, you can write anything about Lalu Prasad. <laughs> You're free. Yeah. But you don't dare. I, I see, as I said, you can look at the various benchmarks. How was JNU covered? How was Rohit Venula covered? Hmm? How was Rohit Venula covered? How is he being covered today when you have the most completely fraudulent commission report? When the appropriate authorities, the collector of the district and the tehsildar declared that he was a Dalit, you have a commission set up to say, with a specific aim of saying, he wasn't. Hmm? Where are these scathing editorials? Where is the examination of this? Okay. Who are they? What do we cover? So, Reliance, as I was saying, owns a, has a million interests. Whatever you are writing about affects them. It's like if you were writing on consumer goods and you were writing on, say, Procter, Gam Procter and Gamble. Whatever you do, you'll be writing about something about them. Right? So you start getting reined in. You get coraled in. You can also look at interlocking directorships. I have a lot of fun getting onto the net and looking at the page of board of directors of various media houses. I haven't done it for a while, but I can tell you it's fun. You'll find boards of directors where there is not a single journalist. Because what, does new, what do newspapers have to do with journalism anyway? Right? They're about revenue. They're about profit. So you have, um, on Dainik Jagran, there was a, one journalist representing the world newspapers, you know, Winfra, the world newspapers thing. He's an Irish guy can't speak a word of Hindi or read it, much less read it. But he's there on Dari Jagra. There are two big, big tax consultants and real estate agents. The third biggest in, in the north. Now these are the people sitting and presiding on the board of the largest newspaper in the country and perhaps the world. This was a few years ago, the names might have changed. But pick up any board you like of the major media houses and find how many journalists there were. They may be the owner's children, okay? And since they actually sat down one day at a desk and wrote something, they'll be thrown in as journalists. But if you cover Narmada or Polavaram or POSCO or these things, you're an activist. You're branded. If you sit on your backside and polish your seat with this, polish your stool with the seat of your trousers for 30 years, churning out yard upon yard of corporate press releases as news, you're a professional. I don't accept this. And I think the idea is to liberate journalism, art, literature, writing from corporations and take it back to communities where it came from. And that's what I think should be our direction. That's where I think we should be going. That's where we should be going with this. But otherwise, we live in the era of the greatest ever apparatus of brainwashing and indoctrination ever devised by human hand in history. Okay? And that is, your, that is your media. In 2009, I broke what became a major political scandal, a story on paid news where I pointed out, I did a story on the extraordinary modesty of 
Chief Minister Ashok Chavan, who had 86 full pages in color on him without a single advertisement in a single newspaper. 86 pages, full pages. And his, ele his election expenditure account on advertising was 11,398. So I want. I rang him up, I couldn't get him. I wanted to know where I could get those advertising rates. <laughs> and yeah, but the shit hit the fan with that story and the entire paid news scandal came out. See how powerful the media are, how powerful corporate media are. The Press Council of India ordered an inquiry. The inquiry committee was, the subcommittee which did the inquiry was Paranjoy Guha Takota and Srinivas Reddy. They produced a devastating 72-page report, naming names which we had done in our story, naming the newspapers, naming the editors, naming all these people. Guha and Guha's report was devastating. It was immediately killed by the press council itself. The press council killed its own report. It reduced it to 12 pages, removing all names. So it was like a kiddies moral science primer. You know, be good guys, good girls, don't, don't do this, this sort of stuff. Well, I have to admit that the next press council chairman, immediately or the first act on assuming the chair was to put that report up, but it was four years or three years later, by which time the issue was dead. Every, now they were, here was the media exercising corporate censorship on an unbelievable scale where it could tie down the press council of the country. Corporate ownership of media has grown. Your historically, the first hundred and, uh, um, in 2016, yeah, in a few years, you'll complete 200 years of Indian-owned media. When you look at Miratul Akbar of Raja Ram Mohan Roy, which from day one was talking about sati, talking about social reform, widow remarriage, you know, education of girls. Of those 200 years, there's 170 years which is praiseworthy and something to be proud of. There were many chapters even there which are not to be proud of, like the communal press. But the mainstream nationalist press was a very humanist Okay, from Bhagat Singh to Mahatma Gandhi, there were people writing, always writing about uniting people, about changing things. Yeah. And no one gives him credit for it. One of our most underestimated journalists was Baba Sahib Ambedkar, who also launched two papers and really, really scathing political opinion journalism, terrific stuff. Okay. And these were your journalists. Your journalists, every one of your nationalist heroes doubled up as a journalist, men and women, including Sarojini Naidu, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, all of them. It's very hard. By the way, that was true of much of the third world. In the Philippines, it was Rizal. Okay? In Africa, it was others. Those coming out of colonial experiences fought for human liberation. They, they saw their journalism as a tool of change, as an anti-colonial weapon. And they gave you a framework of freedom to live in. What have you done with it, is your question. In the last 25 years, all the owners of newspapers, that ownership has changed. Where newspapers used to be owned by one individual, one family, those are gone almost. Those families have become corporations. And you can just look at, each one of them is involved in a thousand other businesses. So their ability is totally compromised and it produces what I call the new convergence in the media. What do I mean by the new convergence? The new convergence is a non-technological convergence, okay? Here's what happens. Over the last, I'm talking about 25, 30 years now, giant corporations come to dominate the media. Reliance is the largest, but there are others. The media are increasingly corporatized, both in structure and in self-image. They're proud to boast of themselves as businesses. BCCL and HT are both family-owned, 
functioning on corporate lines. It's not corporations functioning on family lines. It's families own functioning on corporate lines. You have interlocking directorships on the board. So the head of a major private bank will be on the board of this newspaper. And this newspaper's management will have a director on that, on that bank's board. Ben Bagdikian, who wrote the greatest book on media in the last quarter of the last century, called Media Monopoly, and was national editor of the Washington Post, two times Pulitzer Prize winner. He, he described this incredible web of corporatization and described it as those interlocking directorships. He traced about 100, 200 of them and called it corporate incest within corporate incest because it was so intricate. <laughs> and Bagdikian predicted in the first edition of his book that it would be down to 20 companies in no time. He found 50. He called them the private ministry of information and culture. <laughs> and uh, mind you, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, national editor of Washington Post at the time when it when it published the Pentagon Papers, that book was never reviewed in most places. Okay? Or was called alarmist. He was, he was wrong. 20 corporations from 50 to 20. He wrote that in his third edition. By his fifth edition, it was down to five. Now it's about four companies controlling the world of media, largely. Now, of course, the issue is, but what about social media? It's liberating influence. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. The digital monopolies are the worst monopolies in history for two reasons. Please understand, the extent of monopoly in the digital space is greater than anything in print media or television. Google owns 72 or 74 percent of all search. All search. Google owns 72 to 74 percent. By the way, they will not say more than 74. It's actually around 80%. They're not going to tell you that because if it shows above 75%, there are going to be calls for legislation against that kind of monopoly. Most of them very modestly understate their achievement. Mike, uh, Microsoft, Apple, and Google, what? They own about 80 odd percent, more than 80% of email. Okay. eBay, PayPal, eBay. 68% of all auctions online. PayPal, God knows what percentage of commercial transactions. It's in. The same guys are now beginning to own me, old media as well. Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Many of the others are lining up to make purchases of the Caracasses. By the way, let me also tell you one more thing. The old advertising revenue model has collapsed. Our guys don't want to believe it, but it has. We still keep boasting. In India, the media is growing. Yeah. From what to what. Mm -hmm. And that the fact is that the New York Times survived its worst financial crisis by taking a $1 billion loan from the Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim, who was many years in the top four or five richest men in the Forbes list. Washington Post is now owned by Jeff Bezos. A hell of a lot of other properties in the legacy media, in the old media, are being acquired by the digital guys. Yes, there is space in the digital media. Yes, there is. People like me have moved, put one foot in there now. But I'm saying there is also space in the, in the old media if you're willing to fight for it. You cannot fight for a better media without fighting monopoly. Forget it. Are you going to fight for legislation that will uh, end the kind of ridiculous homogeneity that has been brought to your media? I want you guys to understand one thing. You're a country of 1.28 billion people, 833 million rural Indians speaking 780 living languages, uh, Three of, six of which are spoken by more than 50 million people, three of which are spoken by more than 80 million people, one of which is spoken by more than 500 million people, and a lot of which are spoken by 
one million people or less, one of which is spoken by one person now, like Jeru in the Andamans, and seven persons like Saimar in Tripura, Saimaris. Here's the point, and here's the central point. You are the most heterogeneous and diverse societies in the world, being covered by a media that is more homogeneous than it has ever been in your history. Hmm? An incredibly homogeneous media is trying to cover the world's most complex heterogeneity and diversity. It's doomed. You're doomed. How can they? Why, why the hell would they give a rat's ass about a language of seven people, seven speakers left in Tripura? Why are they bothered if the, you know, They'd be probably happy if the great Andamanese and the Jaravas die out completely, then you can completely use the place for tourism. Eco-tourism. Right. So, your, please understand, that is the, your problem in a nutshell. You're a revenue-driven, profit-driven entity. If you're not going to get profit out of covering you, why the hell should I cover you? I'm not going to cover you if it doesn't make money for me. By the way, that's why publishing houses like Left Word matter. Okay? They're going to cover the issues that matter to you, to your children, to your grandchildren. They bring books that matter, which these guys won't even review. But at least they are putting your books there. And if you want to, you can. So yes, there are spaces in the digital media, but there's also this problem. This huge corporatization that has taken place, this gigantic corporatization that has taken place, has completely squeezed media into a, you've, you've made, the bottom line of journalism is, does it make revenue? If you reduce journalism to a revenue stream, and remember, that has to be the case when your media is a very small department of large corporations. It's not as if the media is the biggest entity in Reliance, right? If it was the biggest entity in Reliance, it would have some more say and some more leeway and probably be more obnoxious. But, but, but it isn't. It's one department. It gets its orders. You will not cover this party and that party. Right? So when you've got this unbelievable situation where you've reduced journalism to a revenue stream, then the rest, for me, it's entire, what follows is entirely logical. Don't you know one thing, don't squeal and groan and moan to me about how bad the media are if you're not prepared to do something about it. If you're not prepared to buy leftward publications, if you're not prepared to buy the magazines, journals, the small, support the small websites that are giving you information at their personal cost. If you're not willing to stand up for journalists, when you, if you're not willing to stand up for the Paranjoy Guha Takutas, for the Neha Dikshins, if you are not willing to stand up for them when they are victimized, for doing what? For bringing you information that is central to your functioning as a democratic society. Yeah? If you're not willing to stand up for them, if you're not willing to subscribe to at least three alternative magazines, all of you are middle class people who can afford that, if you're not willing to subscribe to three alternative publications, don't bellyache to me. You, can, you cannot absolve yourselves of the responsibility of being proactive on the subject. We are not talking about media as media. We are talking about the central, the fourth estate of democracy. As I keep saying, in Mumbai and Delhi, it's very hard to tell the difference between fourth estate and real estate. <laughs> Many newspapers in this country make more money from their rentals and their buildings. I'm not joking. There are major newspapers that make more income. There are newspapers which are running only so that they can make that income because if they stop publication, they lose those premises. Okay? So you have got to be proactive in getting there. You have got to be proactive in, in, in get, getting into this. So you, you <coughs> this, but that was only one part of the interlocking. Big business and media is one part of the interlocking. This is India. Okay, now if you if you look, by the way, 
in Dainik Jagran and some of the other boards, there were people, South Asia representative of McDonald's was one of the, you know, absolutely an authority on Hindi journalism. Uh, realty firms. In one, in one board, the representatives of General Electric and Raytheon were on the board of a Hindi newspaper. Um, and from the World Press Institute, there was this Gavin O'Reilly um, on the Danik Jagran board. I don't think he's there anymore. Now, the, if a newspaper is a commercial entity worried about taxes, worried about real estate, worried about production, worried about wages, in this city, in this city, you've seen far more brazen abuse of the Supreme Court than even the, what the BCCI is doing. And it has come from the corporate media of this city. How many of you are even allowed to know that three times the Supreme Court of India has told the media of this country, you will implement the wage board. And they just tell the Supreme Court to do you know what. <laughs> they don't care. That's why I asked those guys at the compliance seminar, please tell me who are the worst offenders. Nobody answered my question on record. Nobody answered my question. Because they're also scared. Everyone's scared. In fact, one of the media guys said, who can do anything to us? We are the media. Okay. So you have this. This is your other part of the interlocking. The, then you have business families merge with politics. And political families go into business. And both go into media and you have the Marans. And you have the Akalis, you have the, you have the Badans. And you have the Reddies and Ramojira and all of them in, in Andhra. So what you're seeing is a three way. Political families enter business. Mr. Raj Takare, who never held a job in his life, paid 421 crores along with his partner to buy the Kohinoor mill space. No? Um, Miss, uh, what's it? Supriya Sule, who only worked in an NGO, declared um, an asset ownership wealth in her election affidavit. Eight times that of her father's, seven times that of her father's. Sharad Pawar, who declared just 8 crores. And, but I understand that he's a busy man. And he, there might have been some confusion about whether he thought they were asking him about annual or daily income. <laughs> so so, so uh, that was OK. Now, big political families get into business. Now, if the day I read her election affidavit, I said, I want to join that NGO. <laughs> I'm all for the voluntary sector. <laughs> and uh, then you have, you have Mr. Karthi Chidamra from the political family going into business. You have, as I said, the Badals, the Reddies, everywhere. So political families are going into business. Business families are going into politics. Media houses are going into both, and both are entering media houses. That is your new convergence. What can you possibly do? Oh, and another thing, I mean, when I started by saying surgical strike, I'm saying that the lobotomization of the media took place when globalization came in, that became the minimum qualification globally for being an editor, was that you ought to have had a frontal lobotomy and be utterly incapable of imagining even the most remotely independent thought. If you manage that for three years, you'll be editor in chief. <laughs> and that's how the editor died in the early 90s. Okay. Um, you have whether on whether the shameful behavior on the death of the rationalists, whether the utterly crazy look, I want to tell you something. There are things to be proud of. And look at how the media treated those the award wapasi movement. I'm proud of the writers of this country. I addressed the Progressive Writers Association two months ago. And I said, I didn't have the time. I came for your conference only because of this, that you guys threw your awards in the faces of these scumbags. Yeah? And 
There were editorials criticizing them. There were articles on the opinion pages attacking them. You have to understand that somebody living in Bilaspur, somebody living in Gulbarga or Raichur, that award is such a big thing. It's the biggest thing in their lives. To say, I'm going to give it back. Man, you have to understand how much courage and integrity that requires. Your writers did it. Did you see a single big editor return his Padma Shri or her Padma Bhushan? You're tamed. I have to say that I did not return any award because I never ever accepted an award from a government. So uh, I, I, I don't attack others who accept it. It's a personal decision. I believe it. See, it's like, suppose you're heavily invested in a company and you're reading the auditor's reports and you find out that your auditor is being given awards and prizes and money by the company. You're going to be pissed off, right? I'm saying a journalist, a reporter, is external auditor to the government of India. A journalist is an auditor. A journalist is a witness. Yeah? That's my role. So I, I can't be taken, if as long as I'm covering the government, I should not have any financial dealing with them. I've worked on several government commissions and panels. Like for my sins, I was on the BPL census expert group. I never accepted a designation or an honorarium or anything, and I went to the meetings myself. I'm saying that also amongst journalists and all of us, we need to recreate the culture that existed 30 years ago, 20 years ago, of who we are and what we want to be. What is it we cover finally? Let me give you some numbers. These are from, again, from Delhi, from the Center for Media Studies. Well, it's not just the rationalist, I just want digression. It's not just the rationalist issue, it's not just JNU. It's on the, on the beef ban, on everything. The performance of the media is so deeply compromised. Now, triple talaq is the discussion of the day. Fine. Oh, absolutely, it is a crime against women. No question in my mind about that. Yeah, but not one of them cares to observe the irony that you're having this triple talaq debate in the regime of a prime minister who deserted and abandoned his wife without a single word, let alone that word repeated three times. <laughs> How many have done serious and probing stories of the plight of that woman who can't get, who, who can't get, the, so people who can't get, um, she can't get her passport today. She has a problem getting her passport. She was going around from pillar to post. The Prime Minister's wife. Okay. I'm saying, you're covering this talaq business. Yeah, cover it. For God's sake, do cover it. But don't leave out this part. Yeah. Back to the agenda as it is. What is it that we cover? What are the numbers we cover? The Center for Monitoring Studies is situated in Delhi, headed by N. Bhaskar Rao. They've actually cut down the amount of monitoring they do because one, who afford, who can afford it? But they cover, uh, they monitor three major, six major channels and six, uh, three English, three Hindi. Six major newspapers, three English, three Hindi. These are the big ones. Okay, what they cover, the, they look at, in one exercise, they look at the front page of the newspapers and the equivalent in the channels is prime time. Okay, so then they look at news by origin, news by space, news by content label, and what do they get? This is what they get. In 2014-15, 0 0.23% of news came out of rural India. Election year, mind you. That's why it was better. Mm -hmm. uh, where 833 million people reside. This, the, this entity occupied less than 0.25% of space on the front pages. TV stories by origin 
by rural by origin 0.80 percent in 2014 and 0.96 percent in 2015. Why did that go up? A because you had five major state elections and B because of the so-called drought, which is another story. It's a mega water crisis. It's not a drought. You can have five good monsoons. It's still going to be a very major problem for you because of the inequalities involved in the use and harnessing of water in this country. Print stories by origin of rural origin, news stories, 0.24%. Uh, Hindi newspapers, Dainik Bhaskar, Hindustan and Dainik Jagran, origin stories by or on agriculture, 0.0%, 0.2% and 0.0%. We are talking about the front pages. So 0.06%. English newspapers, HTTY Hindu 0 0.1, 0 0.27, 0 0.00. That year is after I left the Hindu, okay? <laughs> uh, and 0.17% is the average. Whole states get zero. There are 12 or 16 states that get zero in a whole year in terms of coverage. By the way, you just have Tripura suddenly in the news not because you have an Olympian who did so well, distinguished herself from that state. It's also the state that ran the best NREGS for 10 years, but you don't get any damn reporting about that. I went there to cover the NREGS when they had cut 53% from Tripura's NREGS budget and doubled the NREGS budget of Gujarat, where everything is done by machines. And one of the work woman workers, Adivasis, asked me angrily, because the money was going to Swach Bharat. Swach Bharat. So, and um, she said, what is this Swach Bharat? I was trying to explain. She said, if you're going to keep our stomachs empty, why the hell do you need to build toilets? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, what do we cover? By the way, 66% of your newspaper's front page 66%. Guess the origin? New Delhi. Lutheran's Delhi, particularly. Okay? The TV gets it slightly better. They are 51.73% of the time, of, of time on prime time is Delhi. And newspapers, front page, 66.92. You can say, you can almost round that off at the in the paid news scandal when we found every big newspaper was conducting this. It then went to the election commission. It's still hanging. Mr. Chavan's case is still hanging in the Supreme Court. Various journalists got victimized along the way. Again, a sign of hope. Where did I get all that stuff from? Yeah. It was the thing that really cheered me up and made me go ahead. 24 young journalists across Maharashtra, without knowing each other or coordinating with each other, after the first story came, sent me anonymous packet. Poor things, they put their name and said, sir, if you use my name, my job is gone. Many of them, knowing that I don't read Marathi, gave me rough translations and said, this is paid news. This is how much we were paid for it. This is how much the publication got per column. And that's how your paid news story came out. From journalists putting their necks on the line for you within that mainstream corporate media. I think it's something to be proud of that with all the damn cynicism, we're still attracting such youngsters to the media, that they're still coming to journalists. Uh, the, the, if in, in rural India, the, the model is criminal intimidation and murder in the cities. See, why is it that many of us don't have the problem? Please understand that there is a very clear caste and class structure in the media. <coughs> Most of us working in the mainstream media, we have a ready-made insurance by virtue of our class background, or oh, very much by the virtue of our speaking English often, and by virtue of being largely a bunch of brands. That's how it is. I, I, you know, I'm, you have to hear this story. I remember when Lalu Prasad 
was first declaring himself to be a chief ministerial candidate. The damn press conference was divided on caste lines. Everybody was sitting according to their varna. <laughs> and they were chewing pan and ridiculing the man and saying, Lal, they want, you know, Lal, Laluji, not Lal, Laluji, Aap Banega Mukhya Mantri, Jagnath Mishra Ji hai yaha, unke pa, pada likadni hai, PhD hai, Chanakya hai, Kautilya hai. <laughs> Lalu listened stoically and said, Jo chanakya banna hai, unko chanakya banao, kalmai chandragupt banunga. <laughs> Today, so all the paid news stuff is now legitimate. I hope you know that. It's now called native advertising. It's called online, it's called native advertising. It's paid for content. That is disguised to look like news, which is what paid news is. It's now called native advertising. You are in deep shit with your media. <laughs> we all are. We all are. What do we do? One, there's no alternative, no option. All movements, particularly progressive movements, must develop not just their own media. Firstly, they also need to develop a media strategy. They need to have a media vision. Understand what's going on in the world. Okay? Now, you've got to have left words. You've got to have these publications. You've got to have the People's Archive of Rural India, which I represent. You've got to have news click, which is accessible to you. However, you've got to also have a strategy. And you've got to understand that one of the first things in that is, if you can't break monopoly, you have no chance. You can fight a positive battle saying, we are fighting for diversity in a diverse nation. We are fighting for heterogeneity in a heterogeneous nation. And we cannot allow 1.3 billion voices speaking 780 languages to be spoken for by a small, narrow elite. We have to have laws and directions that ensure diversity. And by the way, please, the much underestimated All India Radio broadcasts in more languages than the rest of the media together. Okay? They do. Another thing that you have to do is to fight for reforming and strengthening your public broadcaster, which by which I mean it should not be a government broadcaster. It's got to be a public broadcaster. You'll really see how, you may laugh at me, but there were a few years when Somnath Chatterjee was speaker, and even now, where Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha TV offer you much better political discussion without those people being pimps of some corporation or the other. You do get good stuff. And these are the only, these are channels where you actually get Satyajit Ray films or Brinal Sen's films or things like that. Think about it. A public broadcaster as against a government broadcaster. The present regime has been cracked. An earlier regime was cracking down on that autonomy. The present one will take it further. In, the, in terms of their economics, in terms of their approach to the media, they are not very different except that this one brings its personalized, saffronized nastiness to everything that the earlier guys did. As Arun Shori said very correctly, and the one time that I have to agree with Mr. Shori, he said, the NDA is the UPA plus cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, I think that's a perfect, perfect summing. <laughs> it's UPA plus cow. Yeah. So, you have to fight for the public broadcaster. You have to fight for laws against monopoly. You have to fight for laws to ensure diversity. Yeah, you've also another thing. Stop accepting that X is a journalist only if the corporate media certifies him or her. Journalist, the origin of the word was simply someone who maintained a journal. Yeah, <coughs> there are things to being a professional journalist, a discipline, an ethics, a verification. You know, journalism is a discipline of verification. 
Do you find any verification in the nationalist hysteria going on <coughs> on the television now? You know, it's all very well to beat up on one anchor. I don't think that is the right thing to do. Yeah. He is, I mean, it's, it's, it's natural because he, he, you know, he makes the word obnoxious seem like a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it isn't just him. Please understand, those are the parameters the media have drawn for themselves. <coughs> They're looking at it in terms of capturing eyeballs, TRPs, money, advertising. So that's, so then the other things is also that you have to address every political movement, progressive movement has got to develop its strategy and develop its own media. And for that, I think we need to break down the privileges of a very tiny bunch of people speaking for a nation. Who the hell are they? Okay. I'm saying that can happen if we give more and more voice in our stories as journalists and in their stories themselves to everyday people and their everyday lives. It's what I'm trying to do in the People's Archive of Rural India. You can look up the URL, ruralindiaonline.org. And I'll also leave some of those book markers or whatever for you so you can take those and have a look at, I mean, visit the site. You need a large, the, the digital spaces will also shrink. My idea, the one reason why the digital space is a more friendly zone than the others is because the cost factors are very different and much lower than like one last thing about what say we are doing in this india by the way breaks down into 95 regions historically evolved or natural physical regions it breaks down into 95 regions do you know that no publication or channel of yours covers more than 8 to 10 effectively there may be mention of someone when there's a flood or an earthquake or something, but covering them physically. In the People's Archive of Rural India, we are determined over the next five years to put a, a fellow in residence living with ordinary people, mandatory residence of three months, one year of fellowship, from where we will get the only database in this country that will have stories representative of all regions, all cultures of this country. I invite you to join me in that endeavor. And I want to thank you for being so patient with me in overrunning my time. But that's what I meant when I said, you live in a media, in a media world, in a media universe that is politically free, but imprisoned by profit. Thank you.